So uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great to be back here, uh, slightly daunting, admittedly. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about my practice. There's a, I'm going to try to cover a lot of stuff uh, in hopefully a short period of time, because I'm actually very keen to get on to the conversation uh, with the other three. Um, so I'm just going to dive right in. So my practice has three main strands, um, first one being xenofeminism which is a techno-materialist, anti-naturalist, gender abolitionist form of feminism. It's a feminism committed to thinking about scale and how we function as a sapient species on a rock hurtling through space at 170,000 kilometers per hour. Um, AST, which is a group of architects, a curator, and myself, um, whose focus is speculative urbanism and climate change. And then my own independent work, which is thinking about time versus temporality, so time um, as it exists outside the human versus the temporality that we experience as embodied humans. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, so the, the talk I'm gonna, is broken up into three. I'm going to talk about each of those projects and, and then finish off, hopefully, with the, uh, some good questions at the end. Um, so starting with uh, xenofeminism, uh, in, 2015, well, in 2014, uh, six of us met in Berlin, uh, six women from various places around the globe, and wanted to develop a feminism that seemed, that was able to take on scale, was able to think about a feminism that wasn't based around just the body, was able to think about the conditions that we're now living in. Um, so we decided to write what, was, uh, what became the Xenofeminist Manifesto, um, which is called Xenofeminism, a Politics for Alienation. Uh, we have a website designed by Patricia Reed. Uh, the text has since been um, translated into, I think, 15 languages. This is an older image from the website in, uh, a few years ago. Um, but one of the questions is, what do we actually mean by alienation? So when XF spe uh, I'll refer to Xenofeminism through most of the talk as XF, just so for the record. So when XF speaks about alienation, we're not, it's not something one feels as an individual. We're not speaking about an estrangement of an individual subject from their community or society. Instead, it's the estrangement between our sapience and our sentience. By sapience, we mean the human ability to use reason, to both reflect and consciously act on the world, and by extension, to construct it. While a sentient being is one that has awareness of their surroundings, but not necessarily the capacity to deliberately reflect and act on that as a result. It's an idea we take from Ray Brazier uh, that we have the capacity to form and be formed by concepts. It's both knowing that a particular configurations of matter have combined in such a way that the universe has come to know itself, while also embodying that very configuration of matter. We owe this latter formulation to both Carl Sagan and Nikolai Fedorov, this idea that matter folded in such a way that consciousness developed, enabling a universe that can be said to know itself, is an idea that did not originate with XF. However, XF's claim is that this is a condition of productive alienation that provides opportunities through which we can think politics in general and feminism specifically. It's a shift in scale with regard to how we think about feminism and with regard to think, how we think about the human. It's not a disavowal of pre previous feminisms, but a recognition of, of a need for scalable politics, given the scale of the many of the problems we now face. <clears throat> to be clear, however, the distinction between sapience and sentience is not a binary split. Sapience is not an on-off condition, but a continuum with sentience. Humans did not leave behind non-conceptualized knowing developed over millennia, but rather, we mix pre-linguistic knowing with the ability to comprehend abstract knowledge. So an example of pre-linguistic knowing uh, is given by neuroscientist Dean Buenamano, which is a cat that knows precisely when to jump to catch a bird. The cat knows that to be successful, it needs to jump to the spot where the bird will be in the future in a fraction of a second. The cat does not think about this as a concept. It does not think about its capacity for predicting the future. But the cat can nonetheless has a kind of knowing. And it's a kind of knowing that is still available to humans and is quite useful. Navigating through a crowd in rush hour, uh, trying to cross the street and through heavy traffic, uses this kind of knowing. 
But the scale of our pol that our politics operates at now cannot be dealt with with these embodied tools alone. We need abstraction. We need to be able to conceptualize complexity. So the pro this problem of scale with regard to politics is demonstrated by a quote from political theorist Jody Dean, which is Goldman Sachs doesn't care if you raise chickens. Which broadly means, you know, if, if you can eat organic food and you can raise chickens in your backyard and that's great, but Goldman Sachs will carry on uh, and probably end up making a profit from your organically raised chickens. Um, political decisions are often driven by how one feels, however. How one feels about a situation, but to conceptualize and indeed act on the fact that power is won by large-scale manipulation of these feelings indeed takes abstraction. So XF attempts to develop a politics for these conditions by highlighting the urgency around developing a scalable politics. The capacity for abstraction enables us to measure, quantify, and potentially change the massive effects that we are having on the planet. Quoting here Benjamin Bratton, he says, this apparatus that we have built is an accidental megastructure. It's the primary means by which we are able to identify, to measure, and to model climate change. It is also the primary cause of the climate change that it itself is modeling. The integral accident, the snake eating its own tail. So with our capacity for abstraction, we have indeed created some problems for ourselves. But it's also through this capacity that we can maintain any hope of doing anything about it. This estrangement between embodied experience and abstract knowledge enables us to uh, intervene and navigate a level of complexity that we are completely immersed in as a species. This is the alienation that is avowed by XF as necessary for gaining political traction. This is in part because of the complexity and increasing level of contingency, relations between processes of change and relations between contingent parts, relation between proliferation of contingent variables, proliferation in part because of the Anthropocene, in part because of acceleration of development of technology, and the questions that things like AGI will raise, means that we can no longer have directed presence. According to someone that you all will know very well, uh, Suhail Malik, what the future will be is more unknowable than it used to be, in part because of the rate of change of systems we have constructed. What we are left with, rather than an option of building master plans, is studying tendencies and risk management. Our capacity to plot as individuals seems inadequate to the job because of the multiplicity of contingencies we are now faced with. So the leap that needs to be made now is not just scale or complexity, per se, but scale of the complexity. So if we look at something like climate change, our ability to predict what the future will be has too many variables, too many interdependent processes to be able to use our sapient capacities in a definitive way. The question then becomes, how do we use our capacities to manipulate planetary scale forces towards broader justice rather than catastrophe? Because there are known knowns. There are things we know we know. And we also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things we do not know. But there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. <laughs> So that brings me neatly to uh, the work I do with AST. So AST is a group that started in Miami. Um, as I mentioned in the introduction, it's, there's two architects, myself and a curator. Uh, the two architects are based in Miami. The curator's in New York, and I'm here in London. Um, we, we met uh, through a series of workshops thinking about Miami as a global city and what that actually meant. And the more we, we are also looking at what art's role is in gentrification. So in a city like Miami, gentrification is um, very actively uses the art field to gentrify neighborhoods. So it will deliberately get artists in. I mean, there's no, it's very explicit. It gets start artists in, sort of makes a neighborhood um, cool, and then the developers sort of will be able to sell property for much, uh, much more. I mean, this is, of course, a pattern that happens all over the world, but it's very explicit when used by developers in Miami. So our question was, how do you, 
as, a, as an artist have any agency over this? And though this is still a question for us with regard to uh, how cities are, how cities work and, and gentrification specifically, the more time we were thinking about it, the more urgent question we realized in Miami was the question of sea level rise. Um, it, Miami already floods on a regular basis, uh, especially in the autumn, there's this thing called the king tide, so every, every fall Miami Beach floods. Um, and it's, but it's, it's, it's paired with this uh, strange phenomenon that everyone denies that it's happening. It's actually not that strange given that the uh, you know, developers are, are running on a sort of five-year building schedule in terms of <coughs> building properties and selling them with the hope of reselling, uh, the people buying them that moment with the hope of reselling them. Um, the idea that the city's gonna be underwater in 10 years is, is, not, is not so good for that model of, of, of city making. Um, so anyway, this, this is sort of what became the focus of, of the project. So to, we're working within the art field primarily, but we're interested in the interdisciplinary capacities <coughs> of the art field. So I mean, how we work uh, with you know being in various places is basically we have a lot of conversations uh, via Google Hangout and Skype and that kind of thing. So once a week we meet, we sort of have assessments. We sometimes have opportunities to do places in uh, to do things together in real spaces. So for example, um, well I'll, I'll come I'll come to some of the examples in a minute. So. Um, the question, so, artist, the question moving from artist agents, of artist agency with regard to gentrification, uh, moved to this idea of, of climate change. So Miami, in combination with things like New Orleans, uh, is, are the, Miami and New Orleans are the urban spaces within the continental US that are on the front line of sea level rise, particularly. So this is our focus, moving away from art's effect on urban spaces to the question of what's art's role, both systemically and on an individual level, uh, to develop new ideas with regard to how humans might deal with climate change and its effect on urban space specifically. Um, I want to go to a quote by a uh, writer, academic Andreas Malm, who wrote a book called In the Progress of This Storm. In this quote, he's speaking about theory, but I think it can be uh, useful for a way, as a way to think about art practice as well. So he says, action remains best served by conceptual maps that mark out colliding forces within, with some accuracy, not blurry charts and foggy thinking, of which there is no shortage. Theory slash art can be part of the problem. Even if it's up for reevaluation in a warming world, this must apply uh, to it as well. Theory two is called to, an account, called to account, required to demonstrate its relevance and declare its contributions, even if some of its producers and consumers would never think of joining some direct action against, uh, direct action against fossil fuels. So what is art's role and what can we contribute as a field? Art practice can produce ideas uh, that cannot happen through, through more linear directed lines of thought. Rather than provide direct solutions, the kind of thinking that happens through an art practice can synthesize divergent ideas that might otherwise, what might not otherwise meet or make sense together. Art as a field is particularly well suited for transdisciplinarity, which is progressively more urgent as we face proliferation of uncertainty and con contingency due to climate change. The future has always been an unknown uh, has always been an unknown, but there are more known unknowns and known, unknown unknowns now than previously when the climate appeared to be a stable beast. So the kind of work that AST actually does, as I said, is mostly within the field of art, both in a more traditional sense of doing exhibitions as well as uh, on a more discursive level and bringing disciplines, to, uh, a range of disciplines together. So I'm going to talk about, actually, how am I for time? I forgot to st start my timer. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to carry on. All right, excellent. Okay, so I'm going to go through a couple uh, a couple projects that we did. I'm not actually going to show the videos because I, I think it'll take up too much time. But you can have a look at them if you're interested at, at another time. So, um, so both of these exist within traditional art contexts of exhibitions, but also have aspects to them that begin to interact with other 
other practices aside, outside of art. So the one I'm going to describe first was a project, uh, a commission for the Shah Jah Biennale two years ago. And we were interested in the idea of time and the persistence of it to appear to flow only in one direction. This problem of not being able to remember the future, which of course presents direct problems for communicating convincing narratives regarding what is to be done with regard to the future. So we were looking at Claude Shannon, deemed father of information theory, and he wrote a paper called The Mathematical Theory of Communication, which describes how information is communicated through a system and that noise is an essential part of any commu communication system. So we took, we took that as a model uh, for the basis of a, a piece called Noise Back Broadcast Through the Persistent Illusion. It's a seven screen installation in two, uh, in two chapters. So we included the work of other, other disciplines, as I said, so planetary scientist Pascal Tricarico, which actually the animation that I showed at the very beginning was, was his animation, artist Keith Tilford, and architect Keller Easterling. The general feel of the installation was of a control room, giving you too, information, too much information at once and too much for any human to manage. <coughs> there were three main screens in the center. Uh, this is an image of, the, of, the, of these three main screens. The first three minutes of the, of the video explain Shannon's theory of communication, but present it running in reverse. If communication happens in time, going from past to future, we pose the question, can we use this model to understand how we can communicate with the future? Given that many equations in fundamental physics are, are time symmetrical, meaning time can go in either direction, could we use Shannon's model to conceptualize this communication uh, running both forward or backward in time. The video proposed that we can use noise as a medium through which, to, through which information can be sent as a signal across time. So the rest of the video was done in collaboration with writer Keller Easterling, uh, who we were in co conversation with to develop the piece, but due to the really short time, we just took uh, a text that she had already written rather than commission a new one. We had a very I mean, I think like with a lot of art commissions, you know, someone will call you up and say, can you do uh, a piece? Can you have it done in two months? And uh, it's not always the easiest to then ask other people to work in that same time scale. So we ended up using a, a text from Keller that she had already written for a lecture actually here in London. Um, so broadly speaking, the videos uh, on the right and left, on, on either side, sort of one in Arabic, one in English, obviously running in opposite directions because of the direction of the language. Uh, it was done for Shaja as well, which is why the Arabic particularly. Um, they sort of describe, they describe the, the larger systemic conditions that we're living in, and then the central text in the middle was more describing the vertigo of what it feels like as an embodied individual sort of falling through that sort of overwhelming uh, amount of information. Um, so in addition to uh, more traditional art spaces, we wanted, as, I've, as I mentioned before, to use art as a platform to get disciplines to talk, different disciplines to talk to each other. So we, we got a, a grant to do what we call the research intensive. And it was a day that we broke up into two halves where we got um, Bruce Mowry, the city engineer from Miami Beach, Giantha Obersquera, who is the chief climate modeler uh, in Miami, Kim Stanley Robinson, who's a science fiction writer, Philip Stoddard, the mayor, and Natalia Zuluaga, who, was a, who is a uh, curator in Miami. And then the four of us, architects, artists, curators, to try to have a conversation and see what could come from this cross-disciplinary uh, fertilization, I suppose. So you've got a science fiction. What, what we really wanted to see is if you get ideas uh, from a science fiction writer, someone like Kim Stanley Robinson, who writes science fiction that's very science fiction. It's not fantasy. It's very much based in um, very well-researched science. Um, you know, talking to the city engineer of Miami and see if they had anything to talk about. And we broke it into two halves. So you had one half was private, one half was public. And also to see how, what sort of, what sort of things they would say, if they would say different things in private than they would in public. And indeed, they did have a private, the, a public spiel that they gave at the end of the day, which had a, it was very different in tone from the day. And I, I can go into the details of that over the conversation, uh, but to save time, um, it, it, it was quite a, a different sense between them. And actually, we ended up publishing the public version of it 
uh, an edited version of the public um, of the public uh, section of it because uh, a number of people that participated did not want the private one uh, published because of various privacy issues. And it was because because as I said earlier, I mean the issue of climate change in Miami particularly is is very tricky. Like there's a lot of people that don't want it to be known. There's a lot of money invested in the fact that. Um, you know, trying to keep as quiet uh, and non-alarmist as possible about it. Um, so shortly after this, we, we went on to do another um, installation in an art context at Art, art Center South Florida. This is from the Andromeda Strain, which was a space that all of us were quite excited by and very inspired by. And you'll see actually in the this is the actual installation, so you can see where the influence from, from that came in. Um, so we returned to the image of the control room. Uh, it was, again, a multi-screen uh, installation. And we returned to this question of communication via noise. Um, so it was a four-screen uh, installation, tw a 12-minute central video, and then... Uh, so in, in terms of the way we broke up the labor, two, two, the, two, the, uh, the two architects based in Miami dealt with the space, and then the two of us that are outside of Miami uh, focused on producing the videos. Um, so this is actually a, a 3D model of, of the installation to give you a sense of what it was. So what we got thinking about is that communication with the future is not a problem. Uh, communication with the future happens all the time. You can look at the paintings of Lascaux, and that's like, you know, early humans communicating with the now, in a sense. But the difficult part is actually communicating with the past. So how do you actually get this to run backwards? How do you, um, how do you get a future, a future human to let us know how, how bad it gets? Um, so... The text from the main video acts as this, is, is a fiction which is this voice coming from a drowned future trying to get a message through to us. So if you take the video from Shaja suggesting that information be, can, can be transmitted uh, using noise as a medium, this video is a demonstration of that. It's a video, uh, it's version, it is a version of us in the now doing our best to translate this transmission from the future into a comprehensible message. But it's suggested that these messages are sent via noise are often misinterpreted. They're prone to being read incorrectly. <clears throat> so the video gives a specific example of this. It claims Atlantis is a message that has arrived to us through the noise of time. It is a message that has been misinterpreted as a myth from the distant past rather than a memory of our collective future. Now, I'm not going to show the video because it's long but you can watch it another time. <laughs> um, I'm going to do another time check. Sorry. Where am I at? Uh, six minutes past. Yeah, it's got 17 more minutes left. Okay, excellent. I'm going to be even quicker than that. Okay. I mean, if we have time later, maybe we can look at it, but I'm actually really keen to, to have this conversation. So I'm going to quickly go through... Um, I'm going to quickly go through some of my more recent independent work. So... When I say independent research, it's not really independent research. It's just not an collabor uh, ongoing collaboration. So a lot of the work that I do, uh, that I'm, I'm embarking on now, is, is independent research, but the individual projects themselves end up being collaborative. And I think the thing that I'm interested in, in collaborating with more is actually with, with scientists uh, thinking about the ontology of time, essentially. Um, so I'm going to... I'm going to give you another quote from Andreas Malm. Um, so Malm says, this is again from the same book I mentioned earlier. So now more than ever, we inhabit the diachronic, the discordant, the incohate, the fossil fuels hundreds of millions of years old, the mass combustion developed over the last two centuries, the extreme weather this has already generated, the journey towards a future that will be infinitely more extreme, the tale of the present emissions stretching into the distance, we are only in the very, very early stages, but already our daily life, our psychic experience, our cultural responses, even our politics show signs of being sucked by planetary forces into the whole of time. The present dissolving into the past and the future alike. 
So here he suggests that our relationship to time is already stretched and is intimately tied to time outside of experience, tied to both deep past and deep future. The human experience of time has histor historically guided our conception of it, but this anthropogenic conception of time is too parochial for our current needs. The primacy of phenomenological, human experience, phenomenological experience of time is no longer sufficient for how we organize, inflect, and orient the systems we have created because these systems function on scales beyond the experiential capacity of the human. High-frequency trading, GPS satellites, and the work done in fundamental physics provide examples of this extra-human time. These conditions establish a need for a rethinking of time itself, <laughs> demoting our experiential understanding of it and removing ourselves as its primary message. Me measure of its ontology. Well, that's odd. That's not what I expected. Okay, let's try that. Okay. Um, so as a way to begin to understand extra human time, I look to physics. So for, for two videos I made in the last year, one for the Nunnery Gallery and, the Queen, and Queen Mary University, and one with Arts at CERN, in collaboration with Seth Ayaz. Um, I looked to, for both of these, I looked to physicist Carlo Rovelli. I made two, two videos based on his book, The Order of Time, one of which was silent, being shown here, uh, made to be projected onto the side of a building at Queen Mary, and the other it was a tor for a touring exhibition. The one, that's the one produced uh, by Arts at CERN. So the questions that interest me both in, these, in both of these works and going forward with this project, which is sort of a, a much longer research project that will involve both writing as well as, um, as well as making more visual work. So the questions I'm really interested in are questions like, what is time itself at scales beyond experience? If the planetary scale of deep time becomes the scalar middle mark, how does the persistent linear experience of temporality then tie to time at scales of the cosmologi cosmological or the quantum where this intuition of linearity is no longer useful and probably inhibits comprehension because it's ontology that might be otherwise. Does our experience of time have more to do with evolutionary expediency rather than how time actually functions? And finally, what can thinking about time's ontology provide us conceptually with regard to the effects of extra human time that, with the effects that extra human time is already having on, on us, with things like HFT, uh, high frequency trading, GPS, uh, the, the examples I gave before. Um, so that's sort of a sample of the other one. This, I'm going to let this one run. This is the one that was done with Arts at CERN. It's actually, the soundtrack for it is, is, uh, was done by Seth Ayaz, and I'm not playing it because then you would not be able to hear me. It's very, very loud. <laughs> Uh, if, if we want to show that later also, maybe we could to give you a taste of it, but I wanted to give you a sense of what it was. So it was a double screen installation. This is a, a, a shot of it installed, and that's sort of the, the two screens running simultaneously. Um, so just to finish, um, Xenotemporality, which is the, the title that I'm going with at the moment uh, for this, this, this project, is an attempt to look seriously at the questions that I just mentioned. It endorses a necessary and productive alienation between our experience and our knowledge that broadens how we think about the very idea of the future and how we might go about not sailing ourselves along with a multitude of other species into oblivion. I used to, I, I, I used, when I used to think about this, I used to think like how do we use it to construct a future? And actually the more I think about it, the more I realize that actually because of this impossibility of directed presence, because of this um, excess of contingency, trying to construct a future is seeming less and less viable. So it, it's more a constant management of, of, of not driving ourselves over a cliff, as it were, um, <laughs> so, to be cheery. Um, <laughs> Uh, it's, time, uh, it's time and time scales outside of the experience, experiential that is one of the core problems with regard to dealing with the Anthropocene. How do you get a species that has evolved over millennia to perceive time in a particular way, time that appears to go from past to present to future, to make commitments that will to the, for the benefit of a time that they will never see? Of course, we have done this in the past, often in the form of sacred architecture or large-scale engineering projects, for example, but broadly speaking, the temporal commitments are local. 
And even with these multi-generational projects, they only tend to function at the scale of centuries, which is, of course, a nanosecond. If you're thinking about temporality of the planet, never mind the cosmos. What would our ability to comprehend and de-exoticize time outside of experience mean for our relationship to something like the Anthropocene, which collides and intimately entwines geological and human time scales? Can the understanding of time and physics provide us with better tools to understand our place in time? And I'm going to leave it there, and maybe we'll just go on for questions. So what I, what I wanted to do is just maybe pull, pull out a few kind of thoughts that I have that I know resonate with some of the work that each of you do. So they're just kind of general thoughts. And then I'll, I'll leave it to you to take it away with something more specific. But things I was thinking about was um, collaboration and the work that you do with collaboration. Um, and I know some of you collaborate. Um, and, and through those collaborative exercises, that kind of investigation of governmentality and power, particularly in like, the ASD project, um, and I was also noticing um, your use of uh, the visual and the spatial representational practices. Um, and I know that um, some of you um, are very uh, much experts and researchers in that field. Um, and just thinking about the relationship possibly between those and this notion of modeling um, that I think some of you would also experience. Um, and then also that idea of scalability, scalability in time and space, um, this notion of um, the cosmic, the microcosm to macrocosm. Um, as I was hearing it, um, and the notion, perhaps with that, of borders um, uh, and crossing borders. Um, so those were just kind of loose things, and I'm kind of echoing what I understand of the three um, research practices here. Um, and with that, maybe I could pass it over to each of you to speak from your perspective um, and open up conversations and questions. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I thought... Um, from what you were talking about, I was thinking a lot about what you had said about the scalable politics in relation to xenophilism feminism and the scale of the complexity that we are kind of facing now. Um, and really, I mean, I'll say a little bit about the work that I'm doing with Maria as well, which is a project called Technological Atlas, and it tries to kind of represent the border regime um, as sort of migrants come into contact with it and using visual and spatial methods. Mm -hmm. 
Can I put here? Yeah, sure. Okay. okay. Uh, so one of the things that we're really thinking <coughs> about is how you kind of map this incredibly complex um, landscape, but also the politics of the border regime and the kind of governmentalities, etc., of it. And we've been thinking a lot with the idea of kind of orientation. Um, and so I was thinking about the things that you're saying, right, scale of the complexity that, that we're facing. So, so how do we kind of face that complexity? How do we intervene within it? And um, for me, you know, maps are normally about sort of navigation, right? The standard kind of map is about navigation. This is kind of what a lot of the kind of architectural modeling is also about. And so rather than that, to think through orientation. So how, does, how do these kinds of modelings of different worlds orientate us to other other ways of thinking and being. Um, and I suppose the only thing I want to add there is that a lot of the work that we've been doing has been trying to think about more relational forms of kind of doing um, you know, politics, but also kind of the, these sort of spatial visualizations, etc. And somehow, because you mentioned Benjamin Bratton at one point, right, he was sort of saying that the abstraction is going to work. A kind of problem, but also might, well, might let us out of, get us out of it. But I think one of the issues that's happened is that because this sort of because of the com complexity of the, f the space that we face, one of the responses has been through abstraction, but also through calculation. Mm -hmm. And so there's a kind of politics of verticality that is very much within the space of kind of you know urbanization, architecture, etc. And somehow how we think beyond that as a kind of feminist response, seeing a feminist response through, through kind of more horizontal politics. Um, maybe I can yeah. stop there and then... Can I ask one? Yeah, of course. Can, can you say more about how you would distinguish between horizontal and vertical politics? Like what, good question. So I'm, I'm particularly thinking about certain project, projects that speak about kind of, you know, the, so, so I think, um, for example, the stack, the metaphor of the stack that Benjamin Bratton uses is very much about this kind of verticality, right? A layering of the city, the users, the, um, the kind of, I don't remember exactly what phrase he uses. <laughs> the kind of internet is another layer, the city is another layer. It's the stack, right? It's the stack. And I think, whilst I understand this kind of conceptualization, I think when we think about politics, the politics has to move through that mm. stack in various ways. And I'm not sure that this vertical model is that helpful anymore. Mm. Um, so, yeah. okay. Are we going like this, or are we going um, like this? Whoever feels like talking. I mean, I can, I can, I can jump straight mm. to the, I mean, the, I, I do th I do think Bratton's model is useful, but I don't think it's adequate mm -hmm. as well. Like, I mean, I think there are th useful things in it in terms of a way to conceptualize um, these systems, but I, I don't think he, he deals with the politics adequately. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, this is why I asked about the question about what, whether you meant, what you meant by verticality and horizontality, because I, I, I do think um, there is a... a like where where is agency and this is sort of something that I, I I've seen him get asked and he always seems to skirt it and so it's like wh where is the question of of agency whether it be agency of an individual or agency of like a, a collective um, kind of understanding of a situation like how 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 does one or how do do many sort of have a have a uh, any agency with regard to something like the stack. I mean, I, I don't really, I mean, I think where I do think it is useful is, is as a way to conceptualize this idea that we've built something that we, like, we've, we've built a car we don't yet know how to drive. Mm. <laughs> uh, you know, we, we've built this thing, we don't really know what we're doing, because it was sort of built on the basis of, like, this will work in a small, like, I'm building this to make this happen, but then you realize the whole thing ends up being the system that does something uh, in, in addition to the original thing it's designed for, like when these things become a system. Um, That's your time. Uh, okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, can I, can yeah, I yeah. follow that? Can I follow that a little bit? Um, just on the, on the topic of agency, I think, and just thinking about a little bit of... Um, about what you said, I think what I really um, 
so what resonated with me is this idea of uh, alienation that kind of pulls you into kind of political action mm -hmm. in some form. And, um, and, and also this extra human or the, or the or notion of some kind of extra temporal existence, and, uh, et cetera. But I was just, um, I, it, it kind of, um, those two things seem in a, in, a, in a strange way kind of wonderfully contradictory because mm. uh, this sort of extra human is completely the, the, the non-agential kind mm. of, um, thing that's outside of us that is the climate that is, um, and then and then um, there's obviously this kind of pol like political sort of urgency that, that comes out of it so this it's maybe dealing with these contradictory moments um, that's great um, but I but I also wonder about um, uh, not just the sort of extra extra human or or but maybe taking this idea of the Zeno mm -hmm. uh, in, in, into, because you do mention some kind of human, which is quite interesting. It's refreshing. That's the kind of re return of the agency in a certain way. Um, and I wonder whether there's another kind of, uh, uh, maybe if, if we look at something like um, Hellier's sort of racializing assemblages or something like that. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, a, a, a little bit about it. Um, well, it's. I, I guess it's. Um, it's. It's only a book that I'm reading right now, so I'm very <laughs> excited about. So, um, but uh, but it, 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 it's a book called Tobias Viscus uh, by Alexander Hellier, um, and and it's a kind of uh, a commentary on the notion of kind of post-human, uh, mm -hmm. the idea of the post-human, um, and by considering that these ideas are, are very important for looking at agency and and, um, and how we can think through different forms of agency that are not just sort of uh, human as in like sort of Euro Eurocentric um, rational man or, or uh, th those kinds of ideas uh, but taking those further but I think what he does is he takes it even further by saying that those forms of post-human sort of uh, ways of thinking about uh, power or whatever you like is not do not consider other forms of racializations uh, that then transform humanity into uh, what is human, non-human, and uh, somewhat human. I think there's some kind of in, in a in, in a not not as something essential necessarily, uh, but as something that's uh, socio-politically historically uh, produced, but need to be acknowledged regardless. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, I'm kind of waffling, yeah, yeah, but, <laughs> and I don't, I don't even know if this is a, a question really, it's just, a, it's just a part of the question. It's about agency, yeah. the yeah, question. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, sort of pulling these three together, <laughs> if I can do that. Um, it seems to me, if I'm thinking about the kind of progression of your presentation, beginning from xenofeminism on to the alienation of time. Um, that's, and, and also thinking of the sort of the stack, but the inadequacy of the vertical versus the horizontal and the kind of entanglements and this kind of anthropogenic um, limitation, let's say, of this perception. It feels to me like uh, we're sort of discussing the crisis of representation in the Cartesian sense uh, in terms of the power dynamics that are imbued within the Cartesian perspective, um, within this kind of politics of representation and these power structures, um, which are discussed, of course, by feminist new materialists. I'm thinking, of course, of this quantum subjectivities, because you base yourself uh, very much in physics. and. I was thinking about how, of course, time is perhaps the, in quantum subjectivity or in quantum physics, time is, is finally liberated from this linearity, this anthropogenic um, sort of uh, uh, limitation, and also these, these structures of power become dismantled and are refocused locally on the apparatus of measure, for example, which then have an agency 
which is again away from this anthropogenic. So I suppose I'm thinking about um, how you, you work very much with physics, and I'm wondering how much does the the yeah quantum worlding, for example, come into what you're doing with this alienation of time? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, it's it's just starting to. Um, I mean, I, I I do find myself reading quite a bit of um, what are probably popular science because I don't read math essentially. Um, <laughs> so what what I what I have what I'm able to access is is written in, in verbal language, which is very limited when you're getting into physics. Um, but I am very interested in in time, like the sort of breakdown of linear time at the quantum level and sort of what that means for us. I mean, I think I have reservations about using it too much as a metaphor. Um, I mean, and I, I, I'm hoping I can avoid doing that. It's tricky because uh, when you're trying to understand what something means for a human that's completely outside of human scale, it's to... to to not slip into metaphor, I think, is, is quite tricky. I'm not quite sure what else, um, what other forms we have. Um, but I think my aim and my, my hope is that there will be a way to, to speak about these that are not just poetic metaphors, but actually understanding how time functions at these different scales and if that can offer any light in terms of how we understand ourselves in time. I mean, um, I mean, someone else that I'm quite interested in is, is somebody like Thomas Metzinger, which isn't physics. It's it's very, but you know, claiming that the self is a very, you know, is, is a constructed thing. There's no such thing as the self. Is his claim. So, you know, what what does that mean for thinking about physics, for example, and and time uh, that's outside of human scale? Like, how do, how do those things um, sit together? I mean, if if um, you know, if we can accept that the self is 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 a construction, a, neuro a neurochemical, cons you know, construction. Then, you know, can we extrapolate that that time? I mean, this this is sort of what I was referring to when I was, you know, speculating if time is, um, if we perceive time the way we do because of evolutionary expediency. I mean, we we see motion because it was very useful to see motion. You know, I mean, if a, a tiger was lunging at you, it's very useful to be able to perceive things in time to not become dinner. Um, but whether that gives us any any insight to how time actually functions at scales outside of the human scale, I think is the thing that really interests me. Um, is that, that sort of discrepancy? I guess, I think it's a discrepancy. Um, I don't know if it answers quite what you Yeah, I mean, I guess it's I suppose it's the tension of of mm. of, of, of these two um, these two realities in a way. The, for example, the quantum reality or the reality of not being lunch. <laughs> 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 I yeah. was, um, maybe I tell a little anecdote. Um, no, because I was thinking how much this is really um, materialized when you work with modeling and so many other things that you were discussing, like in you know, borders and, and all of these threads mm -hmm. sort of talk about this, but I was thinking of modeling specifically because we were speaking to a climate scientist who works in um, climate risk management mm -hmm. and creates these models. And on the one hand, they are very complex, um, but they only account for risk that is towards the human. So if you have a field of sheep that is not owned by anyone, if the sheep are not owned, it represents zero risk. So you have these deeply complex modeling structures that have somehow super simple on you know the impact. And then on the other hand, once you get to policy, they have to be simplified even more because of course policymakers cannot <coughs> account for complexity. So we have this kind of desire to a need to to deal with complexity and somehow the governmentality is suppressing that possibility altogether. That's amazing, that sheep story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean I mean I think this is this is sort of the real 
I mean, one of the many challenges I'm throwing myself into is, is sort of being fascinated with these like real ontological questions of like what things actually are, but then how does that, I mean, I do still have a commitment to the human and, and politics. I mean, I think there's a temptation and I think it's a very romantic temptation to not engage with politics, but actually, when you follow those arguments all the way out, can you act, can you live with the political consequences of that? And I think no, I can't. Actually, I do have a commitment to politics. So this is coming back to the thing of um, why I, the human still has to be there for me. And then this this question of the sheep, like <laughs> like yeah. you know that that you have to simplify things because like who's who's hiring the risk analysis? Like who's who's you know, <laughs> where, where, where does that, what's the, what's, the, what's the motive for the risk analysis? It's, it's financial risk, it's insurance, it's like, um, I mean, it's insurance and, and, and reinsurance. And, you know, that's that sort of, that's who's going to be hiring these things. And, you know, things that aren't monetized are going to be zero. That's, that's, yeah, I mean, that sort of covers the whole freaking problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's it, we're done. <laughs> Can I, can I ask one? Um, I think when I was talking about insurance, when I, when I was looking at um, a lot of modeling, I've looked at a lot of modeling, and because you mentioned physics, um, and there's a relationship between the two things somehow. I mean, physics relies a certain type of physics, maybe not the physics you're looking at, but um, a certain type of physics looks at, um, tries to model the world, um, and certainly there's a, also a relationship. Um, uh, with financial institutions that use physics. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there's a there's a big relationship between cybernetics and physics, and you know, many cyberneticians or physicists, mm -hmm. etc. I mean, it's a particular flavor, and you know, um, there is also a very metaphysical side of thermodynamics and mm -hmm. energies, etc. That uh, people forget, so they take physics to be essentialist in a sense, but it, but it, it totally isn't. Um, but but it is definitely become essential in this kind of, in the risk analysis. Um, so again, there's this, these, these two tensions of this kind of fascination with a type of um, <coughs> physics that maybe escapes. And I was wondering whether, I don't know, there's some, because uh, you mentioned somebody I've never even heard of um, that you were reading. Okay. Right. Um, yeah. About the physicists. Yeah, yeah. the physicists, yeah. yeah. yeah so I was wondering, yeah, if you could just say maybe a little bit more about... Um, <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> or maybe I'll just look it up. <laughs> I won't. Uh, yes and no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's um, that's probably. I mean, good. I, I can I can give you you know the the lay person artist interested. That, that's that's what I want. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's he's written a number of of very accessible books that translate physics into. Uh, language that any of us could happily read and are, are very beautiful and his it, um, recent book uh, is he, he wrote a book recently about time and he, he talks about you know time and relativity through um, and, and the problem of uh, time and relativity not not getting on with quantum time okay, like yeah, they, yeah. they don't mm -hmm. they don't make sense together and this is a, a big problem mm -hmm. in physics um, his specific field is quantum loop gravity, um, uh, and who and there, uh, in contrast to the string theorists, and I cannot <laughs> summarize either of those adequately for you, um, but it, enough to know that they think each other are talking nonsense. Um, personally, I'm, I'm interested in both because I, I mean I've got I've got no um, got no stakes in the game as it were. I just you know I'm, I'm interested in. in you know, trying to understand these these various viewpoints, and if if any of them can help me think through uh, this question of time outside of experience for us, uh, um, the the broadest us. Um, and, yeah. and physics, not biology, for example. God, well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, well, yeah. That too, but you know, one thing at a time. No, but I mean, seriously, I think one of one of the questions that I, I I was originally like when I was first thinking about this, and actually, it's in it's in the, the piece uh, that I did for Arts at CERN is is actually the question of of intelligence, which certainly gets into biology, but I 
I mean, I, I think the thing I came to through making that piece uh, was the question if, um, you know, that we, humans experience this persistently linear uh, thing called time mm. in, in a very particular way. And do we then need to have an intelligence that experiences time in a different way, which, I mean, the, and my thought was artificial intelligence. I mean, I don't think it's it's there yet. So I think this is why I've sort of let it go a bit. I mean, it, because it's it's highly speculative. There isn't artificial intelligence as such yet. Um, so artificial I mean, I, stupidity. No, no, yeah. no, yeah. I suppose I just wanted to um, articulate a slight sort of uneasiness, mm -hmm. which I think comes from sort of, let's say Catherine Yusuf's new book, The Billion Black Anthropocene, the way she sort of talks about the relationship between biology and the construction of the notion of the Anthropocene, and right? that and she speaks about this fact that there's a billion black Anthropocene, the worlds have been ending all of the time, not just now. And I just wonder when we start to kind of work with physics and this idea of different kinds of temporalities, I understand that sort of like, I'm also fascinated by it and I, I'm with you, but I, I just sort of also wonder, you know, about other cultures, other ways of thinking the world that have other ways of thinking about temporality that's not linear. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not quite coming from the physics space, of course, mm -hmm. but there are, you know, indigenous ways of thinking the world that think about, you know, folded time, etc., etc. So, I don't know, just to add that to the mix mm -hmm. of what we're discussing, because it then goes also back to the question of agency, etc. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I... Th I, I this is this is an issue. I mean, I know that this is an issue, and I've I've had this question before. I mean, I think I am probably going to have to address it on some level. I mean, but I think my focus has been more around, um, I suppose, the Western experience of time, in contrast to how it's understood in science, specifically, rather than uh, like a anthropological survey of very, how various cultures understand time, um, which I think is also, a, a, would be a very interesting project, but is a different project. Um, I mean, and I think, I think this, this question about there's been worlds ending all the time is also an issue. I think the scale, um, I mean, I, my, my personal interest is, is around cities, uh, in, in particular, and because of the history of trade, I guess, uh, cities are often uh, near water, and not just huge amounts of people, but huge amounts of infrastructure like nuclear power plants and waste disposal and, you know, just huge amounts of infrastructure that, if that goes down, it will not just affect the people living there, but it will affect like huge amounts of populations that are not just local to the region, but you know, and, and th this will be happening all over the place. Um, and it will be happening, of course, harder and worse to people that are already, you know, this is, the, we know this, this is not, this is not, I'm not uh, doing anything new here, but, um, I, I don't know. I mean, that's that's not really it's not, it's not really addressing addressing your, your your question adequately. I think, but um, I mean, I do I I, ha I have gotten that question around like different cultural understandings of what time is, and I'll probably have to address it on some level. But I think my main interest is 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 is, is exactly getting away from cultural understandings of time, and 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 getting as much as I can to time outside of that. I mean, again, it relates back to the human. So, I mean, I guess I'm, I end up spinning in this. So, I mean, I, I take your point, though. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I could talk all night. <laughs> <laughs> I just was thinking one little thing. In, I cannot imagine a non-cultural understanding of time. You know, you were saying, I'm mm. trying to think of time uh, outside of like a cultural yeah, okay. understanding of time. And I thought, is that possible? Um, well, I mean, I don't even know if it's possible to, to think about time outside of the human being that I have no other yeah. resources but my 
humanness to, to, to do it with. So, I mean, I, that is also fair, but I think there are ways to, un, I mean, I think, I think this is where abstraction, or, you know, the human capacity for abstraction does enable us to understand things outside of experience. Um, the experience of that understanding, you know, might well be, may, may need to be taken into account as well. Um, and of course there's the culture of science and like how, how knowledge is produced and all this sort of thing. But I do think there's a difference between the anthropology of science and the content of science. I, I think you can actually look at truths um, you can look at them within the culture that they're produced but they, they have realities independent of that culture I think I know a lot of people probably don't agree with me on that it might be a um, very contentious point but I think there are things in science that are testable that um, work whether we're looking or not. Mm. Uh. I, I was going to maybe open it up but also just maybe a comment because I think it's a hugely important mm. question and um, I, I'm just thinking now about um, you know the, 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 like the rallying cries around quote the science to try to get people to act um, you, you know in this um, need possibly um, for um, uh, a, a for a belief to kind of trigger collective action of some sort. So I think it's really interesting. I mean, whether it is or is not a universal, um, I think it's interesting when it's used um, to mobilize uh, political or um, uh, other, other kinds of collective action. Um, but maybe I'll, I'll just hold that because I'm aware of time and I really want to open it up um, to the floor. Um, hello. Uh, are there any questions from anybody here? You want to raise your hand? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. We should ask as well. Oh, okay. Is that okay to open it up now? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure whether this is worth bringing up or addressing, but in your um, speaking about an ontology of time that is extra human or not experiential, and then you're pointing out to how do we get people to act, um, certain actions um, that their consequences will be experienced outside of their own lifetimes, so or why should that care kind of uh, maybe line of thought. Well, it seems to me the previous point in history where the ontology of time was primarily um, extra human was religion, mm. I guess. In, in this framework, and is it worth addressing this at all, or is it tricky ground? I don't know, have you thought about it? It's adding this whole other big package to it, but... Well, I think, I mean, I, I, as, as I mentioned, I mean, I think where we have, we, the largest we humans have, have done this previously is through, like, sacred architecture, or through, you know, um, or, you know, also through large-scale engineering projects, you know, we've built these sort of large multi-generational things, sometimes through religion, sometimes through, um, like, there's these amazing wells um, to, to get water, but there's incredible structures, these incredible architectural structures that lasted for, there's, they still exist. Um, I think they're drying up, though. Um, but anyway, um, I mean, I... I is it, I, I don't particularly find it a tricky question. I mean, I think we were, you know, we had mythology for a long time. And that, you know, in, inspired humans to do all sorts of crazy shit. Some of it was good, some of it was terrible. Um, I don't think that necessarily is something, I, I mean, I don't think this is what you're suggesting, but I certainly don't think it's something we need to return to to understand. Uh, time outside of experience I mean, that would help us so to speak <laughs> 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 um, uh, I mean I yeah I don't know I mean I, I don't know if that really addresses it I mean, yes I think that is where we have 
maybe done it in the, in the past and it seems you made some of it, yeah. I don't know, I, I guess that's, that's probably all I have to say about it. I could have, I just, mm. just wanted to add one thing, which is that I suppose the history of science is also wrapped up in religion, right? Mm. Mm. And so you can't really extricate these two things from each other, I don't think, when we go back, so that was all. Mm. Just a little. <laughs> A little no. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, I'm very selfish when it passes in yeah, front of me. No, I was just thinking of how, of course, um, Christianity has been so instrumental in controlling linear time and creating mm -hmm. a calendar. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. this is, has, of course, been a very successful means of control. So I think yeah. we're embedded yeah. in that um, Christian time. Yeah. Um, I would say. Yeah, I'm not going to. Uh, actually, I, I, I might. Is that is that why physics and not biology then? Because um, biology needs a kind of a kind of evolutionary, um, but physics is more ontological uh, because it sounds like you're trying to get to a kind of ontological uh, idea of time that um, that maybe speaks to something like uh, that use ontology. I'm thinking or or may assume maybe you know, yeah. this idea that. There are certain mathematical forms that are just exist with or without us, and so, um, yeah. And, and in that case, you know, the the stories aren't really the, the thing that are going to give you that um, mm -hmm. type of temporality or temporality that you're looking for. Um, but yeah, anyway. And and maybe biology will also speak more to the kind of myths. Anyway. I mean, that's interesting. Yeah. In, in short, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Only in, in what I think. But I, but I I'm, I I I really I I don't. Uh, I'm not. I wouldn't rule out biology. I mean, I'm actually really interested in in, in neurobiology. But I, you know, one, one, thing at one a time. discipline that I know nothing about at a time. Okay, so head there and then. Um, cool. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I think this is kind of maybe brought up a little bit as well in the round table, but um, I, I'm having a lot of trouble with this idea of, and I know you, you, you're saying that you are as well in the talk with this idea of time outside of the human perspective, but I think maybe what I'm specifically having trouble with is that the idea of even getting to that requires a kind of apparatus, and it also requires a kind of an interpretation of the results of that apparatus for measuring or for experiencing time. And so, in that instance, doesn't it? I mean, this for me is pouring a lot of cold water on the idea or even the possibility of having this kind of experience of, you know, extra human temporality. Because at best, even if you're getting a kind of a, a, an approximation of what that might be, uh, it, it seems like a necessary unknown. Um, and, uh, and then at best, you know, just a kind of a more sophisticated iteration of like what the human perspective on time is, right? It's kind of like. Uh, time outside of the human, from the human perspective. And for me, that then is just kind of returning it to the kind of Cartesian subject or the human perspective, but just with a kind of, you know, it's like an additional layer of science. So, and then I'm kind of asking how much does this then bring uh, certain benefits that uh, it, it, it intends to in, on your kind of account of, of extra human time. Well, I mean, I, I, I take the point around how much can we access, you know, I, yeah, I, I said it before, I mean, I think because this is the, the, the biology, as it were, that we're, we're, we're stuck in, uh, it's the only means with which we have to understand the world. Um, but I do think that, uh, I mean, you mentioned, mentioned Mayasu, I think, he might be useful. I think actually uh, Sellers is also useful. He's got this idea of the scientific and the manifest image. So manifest is sort of how we understand the world. Scientific is sort of how science, I suppose, understands the world. And you, you can, um, you have access to one via abstraction. And I do think this, this human, access, uh, human capacity for abstraction is, that's sort of where it is for me, this, this, this capacity that we have to not experience time outside of it. I mean, that, that was in your question. It's sort of pointedly not to experience it, but to be able to understand it uh, on some conceptual level. I mean, we can understand things that we can't experience. Um, 
you know, we, we can see that, you know, time can run in either direction um, on, on, in some aspects of physics, for example. Uh, we, we can see that the, the math works out and, and um, but have no experience of that. That seems like it's completely contrary to our experience of it. So I think it's that, that sort of, uh, that discrepancy that, that interests me. Is how, how how can that how can that be how can how can it, how can our experience of it be so, so stubbornly um, directional and and you know while you have the math working out saying it should not be so. Um. Have any have any um, <laughs> 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 there you go. I just saw people. I might take <laughs> the wrong. Just so we know, how many questions do we have in the room? There's a few. One, two, two three. Okay, three. Oh, oh gosh, there's a lot. And we only have about five minutes. Let's go to the next question. Uh, are you sure? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. You can. yeah. No, no. No. Um, <laughs> okay, yeah, we'll just go. Maybe. Um, okay. Not to argue for anthropocentricity, but have we not um, potentially already, are we not living already in an extra human temporality? in a sense, because the possibility for capitalism or dehumanization of workers, people, the disenfranchised, does not but have to be predicated on a non-human sense of time. Is an, is an unsustainability already because of that? But this idea of a temporal time or non-human time turned to a negative end rather than this concept of a positive. I mean, the short answer is yes. <laughs> well put. Um, I mean, I think I, I do think we're already in it. I mean, well, that's that's why it's exactly why I, I want to look at it more specifically because I do think it's already it's kind of already where we're at. I mean, a, again, like back to this Bratton thing of you know we we seem to have built something and our collective intelligence or stupidity hasn't really figured out how to work it yet. Um, and I, I think my, my, my hope is that trying to understand these things outside of experience, I mean, in my case with this project, it's time particularly, but I think it goes for things beyond time as well. Um, trying to get a better handle on, on this might be useful for, for building conceptual tools to, to, to do this better, to handling what we've actually constructed better. Um, but yes. <laughs> so, um, is it has it totally faded? No, I could say. Yeah, it can it, I, I, just, I just think we, I, I'm curious what, what I was going to say before as well. So. Um, it was going back to what you said that we can understand things that we can't experience, and I totally agree with that. And then I started thinking, and then you started talking about physics and science and stuff, and I was thinking, okay, so then it's about what is it that makes you believe that you can understand the thing that you can't experience? And mm. There could be a kind of faith in the scientific reasoning or sometimes experiments or whatever. And then, sorry, back to my indigenous world. There's also other modes of making you understand things that you can't experience, which could come through religion, as somebody said, or to other things. So I wonder if, and then, you know, I'm sort of supporting you in that sense and sort of saying that, you know, there are different ways of understanding the things that we cannot experience, and it could be two sides, it could be two sides, something else, and they're all sort of productive in that yeah. sense. Actually, can I add something to it? Um, just to add to something to that, which might uh, kind of relate to the question, actually, is, um, is, is this idea of understanding something. Don't you almost <coughs> have to get out of it, in a way? Yes. So if we are in this kind of extra human time, don't you at least get to the edge of it, in some way, to try and have perspective? Um, on it, and, and you know, in w w whichever ways that is. Yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> that's going to be tricky, though, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> the, <laughs> but I mean, the, but could but that I, be the political position, at least, in some way? Yeah. You know, could that be what? Could that be the the? I, I don't want to say ethical position because mm. ethics is not, but the political kind of requirement. <laughs> um, say to, more. How do you mean? To 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 try and get a perspective out of, well, out of this particular type of extra-humanist. Um, because, because 
or, or are we saying every, they're all, they're all, you know, where you're trying to get to is this, I, I mean, is it, is it that we are trying to understand the, 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 the sort of capitalist economic situation that we are in, or is it that we are supposed, we are trying to get a particular view of it that permits political sort of action or, or, or allows a kind of, because you, you, you're talking about the, the form of alienation that then gives us a form of abstraction, allows us to, so it's a, it's a, it's a political position mm. which makes it different from just understanding the way things are in a certain sense, uh, as in, you know, because I think probably uh, the banker or whatever, or, or, or Goldman Sachs probably know the situation we're in better than, in, you know, in, in the way that it benefits a certain, anyway. That's well, I don't, this is slightly tangential, I yeah. actually, before we, but I actually, I, I, I think I need to write all of that down because that sounds right. Okay. <laughs> But with regard to Goldman Sachs, I actually yeah. think, I mean, one of, the, one of the quotes that I didn't have here was from Mark Carney uh, talking about time being out of joint okay. and sort of the future constructing the present. And yeah. actually, I mean, I think, I think finance probably understands the weirdness of time better than yeah. most of us, yeah. more, more than me, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, but so I think, you know, that seems a problem. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, in, in regard to, to the question yeah. too. I mean, it's like, yeah, we probably are already in a situation where time is out of joint, and actually, people working in finance probably have a better handle on it, mm -hmm. and and that seems a big problem mm -hmm. <laughs> if they have a, a, a better understanding of the ontology of what time is for yeah. capitalism. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. Just a quick thing. Speaking of time, so um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I was thinking. So the people that have questions, do you think it's possible to formulate it into a statement? <laughs> Would that work? Who who had the questions? Yeah. So who who all had questions? Oh, just two. But I think uh, if you could, then then we can finish with the two thoughts. Is that? An idea? Yeah. And there were any more? Michael, did you have one? Okay, okay so we have one, two, three. <laughs> and then we have yeah. Oh, four. Everybody who had a thought turned into a statement. One, two. Three. Okay, oh, you have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe when we have a drink. Maybe come in. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Um, so I was thinking about um, the kind of human experience of time as part of digital distributed network or as a form of distributed network called Next Disco. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, and I was thinking about the idea presented here that the future is not a foregone conclusion. So I guess a thought for everybody yeah. Yeah. is how can we, um, when we Imagine when I think about distributed networks, yes. I think about uh, kind of numerical forms or numerical forms of value, maybe. So I'm just wondering if you think through quantum and Bitcoin as like other forms of time, they're useful to us as humans. How can we um, bring non numerical forms of value into our ways of imagining those structures? I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, but it's a great thought. <laughs> that if I had so a chance to offer, I would make her answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's uh, let's yeah. let okay. everybody show <laughs> them. Um, Michael and was there one more? Ken, person with time. Okay. Um, my uh, statement was to do with Bobby. It's been a fantastic uh, discussion and uh, talk, um, and I'd like to just quickly take up the question of Bobby, which Audrey also referred to, um, and I'm wondering. Uh, well, no. <laughs> really stimulated by the uh, early statement from Dan that, that uh, modeling measures climate change at the same time the rate of capacity as the cause of climate change. That's a very, very interesting statement. And I was wondering whether the change in how modeling works has, has led, or the, the quantitative increase in modeling has led to a qualitative change. You know, in the sense that 
previously one would have thought in terms there's a model and there's that which is excluded from the model, you know, whatever it might be. As modeling becomes more intensive and extensive, you know, thanks to computation, uh, machine intelligence, big data, or so, or so on, you can sort of envisage a situation in a way of total modeling where there's no distinction anymore between the modeling and the model, which would obviously be certainly a total, a total disaster as well. Partly a disaster because as this is being approached, what this means, it has, it has a temporal consequence in that you know, the future is appropriated in a sentence at the same time as the intensiveness increases. So things that would be, have been considered unmodelable are now modelable. You know, emotions, love, desires, all this kind of thing, which are then kind of appropriated and, and monetized, in fact. So I'm wondering, in this shift, where the resistance to modeling might lie, if, it, if it's no longer quite thinkable in terms of what falls out of the modeling or what is excluded from the modeling. I can see Audrey's grin here, Charlie. I think we have to have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's, it's a statement. I think we have to just because of uh, the time. But um, I think we should all have a drink and talk more. And I want to say a huge thank you to our respondents, a huge thank you to Diane. Thank, thank you very much.